Good evening, everyone. I, uh, I'm Bob Lynch, President and CEO of Americans for the Arts and the Americans for the Arts Action Fund. And uh, really, really proud to be here uh, with all of you. I want to welcome you to the Americans for the Arts 31st annual Nancy Hanks Lecture on Arts and Public Policy. I want to thank you all for joining us here tonight at the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. We're joined tonight by many, many special guests uh, as well, including members of Congress, state and local elected officials, CEOs, heads of major foundations, as well as some of the nation's most important arts and culture leaders, all of you, and uh, in particular, uh, the wonderful chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, Jane Chu. And also our friend, John Peaty, the newly nominated chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And to Jane and to John, I want to say that this is an audience that believes in the power of the arts and humanities to transform people's lives and their communities. They believe in what you do. And along with the 1,200 people who are here tonight, there are millions more who stand committed to ensuring that the federal government remains invested in the future uh, of that vision through the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and the uh, arts education support of the Department of Education. Last year, yes. Thank you. As you all know, last year at this time, we faced a major threat to the federal cultural agencies. The new administration surprised the nation by proposing to terminate these invaluable federal agencies, and it recommended that Congress discontinue appropriations in the federal budget, essentially terminating the organizations. It was the first time in history that a U.S president had made such a broad sweeping termination recommendation. As a result, we launched the largest advocacy campaign in our history on this stage last year. And I just want to say a word of thanks to my Americans for the Arts board for supporting and urging this effort. Thank you to the board. Would you all raise your hands? Hashtag Save the NEA was the name of the campaign, and this campaign generated more than 200,000 personalized letters and messages to Congress, more than 1,000 office visits to members of Congress by grassroots constituents both here in D.C. and back at home, full-page newspaper ads, radio ads, social media video ads, news articles, and op-eds placed in thousands of strategically chosen media sites across the country and seen and read by tens of millions of citizens. National arts, humanities, cultural, and civic organizations and unions, and we have uh, many unions represented here tonight. Um, thank you to the unions for being here. Banded together to enlist millions of their members in this effort, millions of their members collectively, all of you. We had both grassroots and grass tops arts leaders volunteer their time and their contacts to help us break through the noise. One of those stories that I'd like to share with you tonight is when Hamilton uh, star and tireless advocate Lynn Manuel Miranda came to Capitol Hill in September. Lynn was absolutely amazing. He met with 35 key senators and congressmen, there he is, uh, in a single day. He was passionate, charming, and relentless in his bipartisan focus to restore uh, full congressional funding for the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. And most importantly, Lynn was effective. Just weeks after his congressional visits, and all of your work, and after the onslaught of grassroots visits made by many of you here tonight, the Senate Appropriations Committee voted to restore full funding to the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities.
And this week, the very same fiscal 2018, fiscal year 2018 appropriations bills that have been dragged out through a series of continuing resolutions for the last six months have now been combined into a large omnibus bill. And that bill is actually going to restore all the money, if not increase it, for the NEA and the NEH. Ladies and gentlemen, you, we all together, all of us, did this, and congratulations to everybody here. The United States Congress heard you, and they sent a clear message to the administration that these federal cultural agencies are essential and very much valued by their constituents. However, I don't think that the White House heard Congress loudly enough. Last month, the administration submitted to Congress its new proposed budget for next year, and they simply repeated the same recommendations for terminating these federal cultural agencies. We need to continue our work again this year. We clearly need to be louder, and the perfect time to kick things off is tomorrow, Arts Advocacy Day here in America. Thank you for being part of that. Now, since we know that the administration, this administration, is focused on growing the United States economy, we are publishing tomorrow the full-page ad seen here on the screen in all the major Capitol Hill newspapers. Um, it focuses on uh, effective uh, information about the economy and calls for support that contributes to that economy of the National Endowment for the Arts. So be sure to pick up copies of Politico, Roll Call, and The Hill tomorrow when many of you will be up on Capitol Hill. In these ads, we bring a spotlight to the research that is measured and documented by the administration's own United States Department of Commerce Bureau of Economic Analysis in partnership with the Great Research Department of the NEA. And it's because of this research that we know that the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities grant making and matching dollars are part of a larger $764 billion economic arts and culture industry that represents 4.2% of the nation's gross domestic product and supports 4.9 million jobs. That's big. And I can tell you that these arts jobs are not the kinds of jobs that can be easily outsourced to another country. These are homegrown local jobs and products that are made and hired in America. The same research uh, documents that art product sales are generating a $21 billion trade surplus. We've been hearing about the lack of trade surplus all over the news media recently. You create a $21 billion trade surplus. And we're not stopping there. We're taking the customized creative industry maps um, the maps that Americans for the Arts produces with Dun and Bradstreet and turning them into compelling ads like this one. Um, this, these maps all pinpoint the location of every nonprofit and commercial arts agency all across America, and we can uh, put the maps together for every congressional district, every state, every county, every zip code uh, in the country. And we're going to publish them in colorful full page ads in local newspapers across the country so that key congressional leaders and the voting public also know how the arts drive their local economy and broadly serve their community. Advocacy efforts take collaboration and a united message. And that's why I want to recognize our 85 national partners for National Arts Advocacy Day and the 600 reg registrants who have flown in from every corner of the country. I'd like to ask these amazing Arts Advocacy Day national partners that you can see here on the screen, state arts advocacy captains, so important, coming from every state, and individual registrants to please all stand and be recognized tonight. Please stand. Um, if somebody is here from Montana, we have all 50 states represented this year. Um, but th that is fabulous to have that kind of representation coming from every part of the country. Um, and so now, before we begin tonight's Nancy Hanks uh, lecture program, 
Please help me thank the sponsors that made this evening possible. First, longtime supporter and Americans for the Arts board member, Nancy Stevens, with the Rosenthal Family Foundation. <laughs> Ovation, been with us now for many years, the nation's only television arts network. Thank you, Ovation. And finally, the Max and Victoria Dreyfus Family Foundation. Would you thank all of them, please? So now, to begin tonight's program, um, we, we wanted to kick things off with a few singers. Um, and so we kick things off with a compelling artistic performance presented by the Washington Performing Arts Men, Women, and Children of the Gospel Choirs. So it might be more than a few. Um, since the early 1990s, the Washington Performing Arts Gospel Choir has been performing annually at prestigious venues within the Washington metropolitan area, including the Kennedy Center, the Harmon Center for the Arts, Strathmore Music Center uh, for the Arts, and many, many more. And we've had the honor to work with them in the past as well. Offering audiences uh, both the tradition and the inspirational root of gospel music, this is quite a treat. Performing tonight under the artistic direction of Stanley J. Thurston, the choir will perform three songs entitled, first, Let Everything That Has Breath Praise, secondly, Why Do We Sing, and third, Better. Um, an interesting fact that I am very pleased to share with you is that one of our longtime board members of Americans for the Arts, Glenn Howard, is a member of this incredible choir, and he will be performing here tonight. So the pressure is on Glenn. Uh, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I now present you the Washington Performing Arts Gospel Choir.
please. So next, welcome to the stage, tonight's moderator, Dr. Carla Hayden. Doc Dr. Hayden was nominated as the 14th Librarian of Congress by President Barack Obama and confirmed into, confirmed into office in September of 2016. Prior to that, she was appointed by President Obama to serve on the board of the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Dr. Hayden has the proud distinction of being both the first woman and the first African American to lead America's National Library. Some of us may not realize the extent of the Library of Congress's collection of art, musical instruments, photographs, and manuscripts, which all come with deeply rich stories. For example, another one of our board members, Vijay Gupta, a violinist for the Los Angeles Philharmonic and director of Street Symphony, has shared magnificent moments of how the library invites world-class musicians to come play their collection of original Stradivarius instruments just to keep them tuned. They come in and, and, and get that wonderful opportunity. Another great program <clears throat> under the Librarian of Congress's leadership that all of our arts education advocates will appreciate is a wonderful teacher in residence program where each year a local teacher takes leave from their home school to work at the library and to use their resources to undertake a project to benefit their home school. Great things. I'm so pleased to report that this year the library is specifically recruiting an arts education teacher specializing in either the visual or performing arts to be in residence. So please join me now in welcoming the nation's Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I must tell you, it is great to be in an auditorium full of artists and advocates from all 50 states. And I think that deserves right. Your work is so important. And as the daughter of two musicians, clearly I didn't get those genes. Uh, but I grew up surrounded by art. My earliest memories were learning to read under a grand piano while my parents practiced. And my dad would have to play the banjo and the fiddle, and then it was time. I grew up, and I, it, we all agreed by the time I was 12 that that was not going to be my path. <laughs> the literary arts, though, were, because as I was learning to read, I was hearing music. And where they would hear and look at notes and hear music, I would look at text and hear voices. It's a great honor to be with you today. And I have to just say as a side, when uh, Mr. Lynch mentioned that uh, the wonderful resources at the Library of Congress, as the child of musicians, um, even I know the importance of bringing kids from the Ork Kids Project in Baltimore, Maryland, to the Library of Congress to look at the archives of Leonard Bernstein and get ready for their performance with an original kind of, I guess that's going to be a little Hamilton-y, I can think. <laughs> but to see when they look at his report card, and he didn't do so well, <laughs> like, oh, OK. Um, when they see, and then you have a curator bring out a, a manuscript of Mozart's and the things are like this for the piano part. And then you put Leonard Bernstein, piano parts are like that. And then you have um, the curator say, that's because they were going to play that part. And to see that come in their eyes. So truly, truly an honor. The other honor is to be with, and I asked them behind the uh, stage, could I call them partners in crime for the arts? <laughs> and they say yes. Uh, because in your program, you see the wonderful, illustrious backgrounds of our two guests tonight. Um, Lonnie Bunch, the founding director of the Smithsonian's Museum of African American History and Culture. And Mr. Richard Parsons, uh, 
notable, uh, legendary businessman, philanthropist, and um, I think there's a term they call it fangirling <laughs> in terms of business and leadership. Well, they were the pair for advocacy, and we are going to be in for a treat tonight. So let's bring them on out. talking as, ooh, as I go over here, because what you couldn't hear, and, I, and they're very distinguished and everything, but they're bantering <laughs> about rabbit ears <laughs> as that. And this partnership <laughs> uh, is, is something. And I also uh, know that this has been quite a journey. People see the museum now and they're waiting lines to get in. But it wasn't always that way. <laughs> and Lonnie, would you just say something about your first day? Well, you know, in the beginning, uh, <laughs> there was a staff of two. There was no idea where the building would be. Obviously, no building, no architect. There were no collections and no money. And so when I got to this, back to the Smithsonian, um, after two days, they said, you know, why don't you go see your new offices? So I'm really excited. So I take my staff of now three, and we go to La Femme Plaza, a hotel that's got offices for the Smithsonian. So I go to the offices, and the door's locked. So I think, okay. So I walk down to security and I, you know, stand up. I'm puffed up a little bit. I'm the new director of the National Museum. I'd like to get into my offices. And they say, we don't know who you are. Never heard of you. You can't get in. I go to four different places. Nobody will let me in. So I'm standing in front of the offices and a maintenance truck comes by. And on the maintenance truck was a crowbar. <laughs> so... Being a, being a guy from you're Jersey. You're from Jersey, That's right? That's right. Being a Jersey <laughs> guy. Now, Mr. Parson, you're from Brooklyn. And, yeah. But being from Jersey, we know how to open the door and leave no fingerprints. <laughs> so ultimately, what it told me was that none of us were prepared for what this would take. We had no idea what it would do, and we were so fortunate to have the leadership of Dick Parsons, no doubt about it. And, when you, and I understand that you actually uh, knew Ms. Hanks. I did, I did. And worked with her. I did. Uh, I'd like to say I'm older than I look, except people <laughs> always come up to me afterwards and say, no, you aren't. <laughs> uh, but back in the 60s and the 70s, I worked in the Rockefeller organization. And Nancy got her start, not her start, she was a distinguished graduate of Duke University and all that sort of stuff, but she made her name in the arts, uh, working for the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, working for Nelson and John, Rockefeller in particular, John III. And so I knew Nancy from late 60s on until she passed. Uh, and she was a force, this woman was a force. And she was, I guess, the second uh, and probably most significant uh, head of the uh, NEA and uh, really put it on the map and, and brought along at the time and it was created. There may have been a dozen states that had state councils on the arts. By the time Nancy finished, every state had and uh, she was also a lot of fun. Good gal. So uh, it was a pleasure for me not only to be with you and with Lottie, <laughs> um, but to be asked to speak at Nancy Hanks lecture was a real honor. You, you said that that really meant a lot to yeah, you. Yeah, it did. She was, because she, she believed in the cause. She believed in the power of the arts, the transformative power of the arts to bring people together to create civilization, if you will. Um, but she did more than believe. She didn't, you know, she, she took action. And she 
broke fingers. Oh. And got, and got yeah. folks to do the right thing. No, I under, okay, well, I understand that you two, I mentioned partners in crime. I said, do you mind if I uh, mention that? Because you were quite a duo. Well, Public, yeah, private. He, he was, he was what the, he was the dynamic hero. And I played the role of other guy. <laughs> But, but what, we got it done. Now, Bonnie, what did that mean for you, though, to have this What, what it really meant more than anything else was that Dick really performed a variety of functions. One was to let me dream, to let yeah. me come up, talk to him about what I wanted to do, and he didn't laugh, you know, when there were only three people. And I think the other part is that what Dick brought was a sense of gravitas and stature so that people began to believe that this was going to happen. And that we had to raise, when all was said and yeah. done, you know, like yeah. half a billion dollars total. And really it was Dick believing convinced so many other people to believe. So in some ways, I'm very serious, this would not have happened without the leadership of Dick Parsons. No well, doubt about it. Right. <laughs> yeah, a, a serious moment. Uh, our job on the advisory committee was really to, to do two, two things. One, to bring some credibility to the project, because there was nothing at the beginning. And then two, to raise that $400 million or whatever it was uh, from donors, from the American public, from the corporate community foundations. And then three, to put in place a leader who could have the vision and who could execute on the vision and create this museum, I mean, hopefully all of you have seen it. It is stunning. It, it, <laughs> and, and while I had a lot of help, I mean, this, this board that Lonnie sort of came into, I mean, it was a powerhouse board. I mean, we had Colin Powell and Oprah Kenji. Winfrey mm -hmm. and Kenny oh. Chenault. Linda Wright. And Bob Johnson. And, and, I mean, you know, you name it, we had it. Uh, but let me be really clear. Going to my first board meeting, I walk in and they put me between Dick Parsons and Oprah Winfrey with Bob Johnson sitting across from me. I'm terrified. I'm like, what am I doing here? Well, what did you yeah. say, Lonnie? No, but oh, 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 Oprah offered him a muffin. A <laughs> <laughs> muffin. But you... <laughs> Wow, I, I, I wound up doing this and saying, oh, but whoa, to have to be at that board meeting. Yeah. But you had to be the advocate with the, the government, yeah. and how did you do that? I mean, Well, I mean, I think that what we realized very early, and thanks to the board, was that it didn't matter that we were smart. It didn't matter that we had good ideas. It didn't matter that we were on the right side of history. What mattered was, how do you create a strategy that allows you to be political, entrepreneurial, and nimble? Mm -hmm. And we realized that we had to be, if I was going to be the director, I had to be as much a politician as I was a scholar. And so basically, every time the Congress was in session, I was up on the Hill every week. So it wasn't as if I was saying, this is something I did periodically. This was the job, to work with the appropriators, to get support. And what we realized, and you know, Dick was very helpful in helping me figure this out. You know, you can't manage Congress, right? I mean, so. Um, if, if you could, have we got a job for you. <laughs> <laughs> so what we did was try to find 30 angels, people on both sides of the aisle who would support you. Because remember, with Congress, you don't need to win. All you need is a tie. And that's what we did. And so in some ways, with Dick's leadership, we were able to think, how do we handle the politics? Dick helped us think about how we begin to do the fundraising with the corporate community. And then it was my job to figure out, OK, when all is said and done, what is this thing? And you yeah. were functioning as a really wonderful board chair to have your corporate experience, your experience in the political realm, everything to bring to bear. But I would make the point, particularly for those who are, who are out in the audience who are trying to figure out how to get things done in their own communities of this nature. Boards 
boards function and boards have authority collectively, right? So he keeps saying Dick. It wasn't Dick. It was the board. And because any one of us individually, we didn't have authority to do anything. We just could act collectively with one voice to support the chosen leader. He was the chief executive. And so when you, when you think about how you get something like this done, yes, you need a board that, that, that brings a community together, that stands for the credibility of a project, um, and that hopefully can function and work together to do the kinds of things that boards do, which provide support, financial and otherwise. But then you also need a skillful executive to execute it, to execute a vision. Now, that's the second time you've used that term, execute, mm. uh, because uh, people talk about visions, and sometimes they can be fatal, <laughs> yeah. right? And they have all this stuff, but the execution seems to be also, how do you make it yeah. I, come I, to life? I think vision is 10% of something, strategy is 15%, and execution is 75%. I mean, we all... I'm probably vision limited, um, <laughs> but we all can dream. We can't all then execute on that dream. We don't have the, the skills. When I mean, Lonnie makes short shrift of, he said, I spent all my time on the hill. He didn't spend all his time on the hill. He put together teams of scholars to think through, how are we, gonna, how are we going to display you know, 400 years of African-American history, but not from the point of view of African-American history, but from the point of view of American history viewed through the African-American mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. We had teams of scholars around that. We had teams that had to go out and find the artifacts. Because when we say we started with nothing, mm -hmm. we had nothing. We didn't even have a handkerchief. Um, I mean, literally? Nothing. Literally, nothing. Oh, yeah. There was nothing Tell from what the you Smithsonian did. collections that there you was could not, borrow? I realized that no. if I collected everything within the Smithsonian, it would still only give us 20% of what we needed. Wow. And I never wanted the notion that all things African American should be in this museum. So basically, we created, we stole from the Antique Roadshow, okay? <laughs> and we went around the country. I brought conservators to bring out your stuff help you preserve grandma's old shawl, or that 19th century photograph. And what we would do is when people would bring things out, first thing we would do is have the senior member of Congress there. So he or she get their picture taken front page of the newspaper. <laughs> and then the second thing was any you collections did. that came, we gave them to local museums. Then if it was in the scholarly parlance really cool, it came back to DC. <laughs> but what that really did was give us visibility and suddenly people were calling. Ultimately, as Dick knows, we collected 40,000 artifacts of which 70% came from the basements, trunks, and attics in people's homes. Mm. <laughs> and that, that was just one piece. You know, and then he put together a staff. Um, the, the execution of this building Again, those of you who haven't visited, you've got to go see this building. Um, I do have to tell one funny story, though, because the board played, may I? I oh. Full disclosure, so Mr. Parsons said, I said, oh, were there any fun parts? Because I heard about the crowbar and no staff and everything like that. And he said, sure, there was a fun part. Tell them. All right. <laughs> see if you think this is fun. I thought, yeah. So we, we, mostly we followed Lonnie's lead. And we, we interviewed and then found a marvelous architect, David Ajay. He came up with a wonderful, a wonderful concept. Lonnie can fill you in on all that. And, uh, and we had raised enough money to actually start putting shovels in the ground. And we got to a point where, I'm, I'm gonna let Lonnie tell you how we got the site on the mall, because that was, that was not funny, that was a battle, which we won. But we got to a point where they kept digging down, because the museum goes down 90 feet or something yeah. like that, half mm -hmm. the museum's on the ground. And the trench kept filling up with water, and they, finally the, the architects and the engineers came back to us and said, what's the problem? Well, we looked at some of the old maps of the city, and you know, a canal or a stream used to run down 14th Street, and they just came and covered it over, right, and built the, the city. 
So it turns out that the Washington Monument, which is across the street, sits on a big underground reservoir. And that's what was leaking into our trench. And the concern was if we kept digging, we'd empty out that reservoir and the whole Washington Monument. I'm still would, waiting for the fun would, part. Would, would, would fall over. And so somebody on the board said, oh, I can see the headline now. You know, black people knock down <laughs> Washington Monument. So, but all of us on the board, you know, we tucked our thumbs into our trousers and pulled them up and said, go for it, Lonnie, because Derek, the guy who worked for the Smithsonian engineer said, we said, can you do this thing? He said, I can do it. So we said, go ahead, get it done. Cost us another 40 million bucks, we got it done. Right. <laughs> wow, and you thought that was funny. I thought it was funny. Oh, okay, but you had to have some levity, or you had well, to, you, you the know, obstacles. We had come too far to turn back now, as they say. But you can't imagine what it's like to just see all this water. And you, we brought in engineers from the Netherlands. I figured they knew something about water. Um, and it took them weeks to figure it out. So every morning I would go look into that hole and say, please, please let it be dry. And the first day it was dry, I knew we could pull it off. Wow. Now, the fundraising. So you work in the hill, you're convincing uh, different administrations too. I think people would be yeah. uh, surprised at who your biggest legislative advocate was at the end. When we started, our biggest supporter was George Bush. It's George Bush that signed the legislation. And when we started, there was a lot of criticism about should you build this museum on the mall? And this was before they thought we'd knock over the Washington Monument. There was a lot of concern. And you know, some of it was, is that the last spot on the mall? Should that museum be there? There's limited green grass in Washington. You're killing more green grass. There was a lot of people saying it shouldn't be there. And George Bush actually stood up and said to the media very early on in my tenure, of course this museum has to be on the mall. And that language really helped me every day when I was in Congress talking to members of the Republican Party. Because I would say, your president believes in this. And that really helped us get this museum on the mall. So that's why when we opened, I had to have President Obama and President Bush. Now, now Lonnie, this is a, a group with advocacy. They're going tomorrow up on the hill. So what did you say to the president to make him an advocate for this museum? I'm a smart guy. I talked to his wife. The librarian. The so librarian. So Laura Bush and I began to exchange books. I would give her books to read. She'd give me books to read. We started talking. Um, we became friends. And I began to say, it'd be really great to make sure that this administration that signed the legislation is out in front in helping to make this work. And they were front and center the whole time being supportive of this museum. So my notion is always, go to the power. <laughs> and if you can find a librarian, it might help. <laughs> now, while he's doing all of that, you had to go and ask people to, what was the price of admission? A million dollars? Well, we, the initial board, well, I'm a believer, I have spent a lot of time doing work in the nonprofit world, arts and social services. And, you know, boards give sort of guidance, but basically boards put management in some places and support them. The other thing boards do in the nonprofit world is raise money, right? And if you're gonna be successful, in my opinion, you have to show, you have to be committed, and not just be committed, you have to show you're committed. So we, early on, the first couple of meetings we had, uh, concluded that everybody on the board had to kick in, had to be all into this thing. So we made 
well, we didn't make them, but we somewhere yeah, between did. made and suggested <laughs> um, that everybody had to be in for a million bucks. Who was on the board? Either give or get. Give or get. Give or get. Yeah, because we, we had some scholars and we had some other people who, who might not have that kind of means, but they had reach into the community and they were on the hook to get and the rest of us were on the hook to give. And I think without exception, and we had 30 people at the end of the day well, on the we board. Started 32, we started 19. We had started 19. 19. First 30, 19 people 30, were all 30. in. Mm -hmm. And then as we expanded it, so everybody was in. And when you would go to funders, whether it's corporate funders, foundations, or other individuals, I, I, I will tell you a story, which, not sh well, he's we're passed. We're friends. Yeah, we're friends. Chatham House rules, what goes down in this room stays in this room. <laughs> Um, as I said earlier, on, I had a pretty good relationship with the Rockefeller family, and I th thought it was very important, um, knowing the history and the heritage of the family, that they would be significantly present. So the RF, Rockefeller Foundation, which I now chair, gave, I don't know, five million bucks, something like that. And then I went to the sole remaining member of the third generation, John Nelson Lawrence, David, David, who was still alive, and I said, David, um, you know, I know you want to be a part of this thing. He said, well, yeah, I should, I should be a part of it. Um, he said, but let me ask you this. What has been the history of the board? How have they given? And when I told him everybody on the board was committed for a million bucks, he went, I see, that's pretty good. And then he asked me, what's been the history or what's been our experience in the African-American community? And when I told him, I think of the million dollar givers, yeah. 80% of the people that gave a million dollars were African American. That came out. <laughs> but what it said was there was real commitment, right? Not on the part, just on the part of the board, but it was commitment in the community. And it was not one of those situations where we were turning to others to help us realize a dream. We were out in front and we were asking others to join us. And that joining, yeah, you know, to, join. to support it, but That's to correct. join in the vision. Yep. Now, when you um, you had different uh, champions, uh, Congressman John Lewis started, and that go back to how far back this has gone. Well, you know, the idea for the museum really begins in 1913. In 1913, it's the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg, and there are pictures of old Yankees and old rebels shaking hands, saying the war is over. But you never see African Americans in those pictures, and yet 200,000 African Americans participated in the war. So there was this desire to say, we need to tell a broader story on the National Mall. And there were attempts to get it done, wars, depressions, assassinations. Basically, it really lied fallow until John Lewis um, and a few other members of Congress began to realize that the civil rights generation was passing and that they wanted to control and to preserve that story. And so for something like 17 years, John Lewis introduced legislation to craft this museum. He was finally able to get it passed in 2003 because traditionally when this legislation was brought forward, Initially, it was Republican, then it was Democrat, then it was Republican. This is the first time it was truly bipartisan. So John Lewis worked with people like Sam Brownback, obviously very different politics, but they came together over this issue and they passed the legislation. For me, the creation of this museum is America at its best. It's an America that crosses racial, political lines to do important work. So I think that John Lewis needs to be celebrated, other members of Congress, like James Clyburn, Clyburn really played a big role in making this work. Yeah. And in the business community, you had people who stepped up. Mr. Well, Chenault. yeah, I, I, I thought when uh, the then secretary, I was a guy named Larry Small, who I'd known for years, uh, Larry put the first group together, and I, I actually thought this was going to be, as they say in poker, almost like a lay down hand, because what corporate leader 
could say no, right? That was <laughs> Yeah. And I have a big book of people who said, who said no, I won't, I won't name names. But um, I will. No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, what, what we had to do was not just have an idea, not just have a vision. We had to bring it to people in a way that they could actually see. We had to make it manifest what, what we were talking about and what was going to result and how they could be a part of it. Uh, and once we did that, once we had the plans and the designs and some, you know, some leadership um, from some hearty souls who you know, threw big bucks um, into the pot, including our good friend Oprah, um, then they could see, okay, this train is moving, and I want to have a seat on this train. That was the key. And then once that happened, and then um, while I was the initial co-chair along with Linda Rice, uh, Ken Chenault became the chair of, of the, uh, the campaign committee, and we nicknamed Kenny the Hammer. Well, he's a uh, former he's, chairman of American uh, Express. American Express. Because Kenny, Kenny just carried this big metal object around with him, hit people in the head <laughs> if they didn't give us money. But, but, but you could American see Express. this train was moving, and you have to get that momentum. Then momentum builds and success builds and success. And people want to Ult be part of ultimately it. Ultimately, yeah. we raised $50 million more than we needed. Wow. Uh, And so once more, 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 more than we had designed. Initially on. designed, but I spent it. Yeah, because yeah. now. Yeah, we yeah. never say case you don't need wonder, it. Now we still need 50 million more. That's right. See, they're always doing it because that's the part you want people to join you. You're using those terms. Yeah. You have to be able right. to execute, have the plans, visualize it, show people right. here's what it's right. going to be. We have the government commitment. Right. And but I think it was also crucial, candidly that something that happened when I left Chicago. I came back from the being the president of the Chicago Historical Society. Yes, indeed, Chicago's in the house. Um, and the three people that didn't want to see me go, thanks. Um, but I remember having this meeting and being called into Mayor Daly's office. And Mayor Daly basically chastised me. How dare you leave Chicago? What are you doing going to a one-horse company town called Washington? And why would you want to run a project? And that hit me. I thought, how do I make this real? So I came with the notion of the museum exists now, it just doesn't have a building. So we started doing exhibitions and traveling exhibitions, birthed the museum online, digital first, and ultimately it allowed me to show people, here's what this museum is about. Here's the kind of work we do. Look how good this exhibit is, and we don't even have a building. So I think that, and then we were able to actually get drawings and everything. That helped us make this real. Because the biggest fear I had was people saying, come back to us when you're ready. Come back to us when you're real. So really, because of Mayor Daly's chastisement, it changed the way I thought about it, and I think it was really crucial to our success. He had a way of that. <laughs> yes, he did. Um, Chicago, too. Baltimore. Taylor, two cities. Yes. Why are you going to Baltimore? Yes. Uh, so with that, you know, the pull of it, you had to show things. You had to convince people. You had to, uh, how did you keep your, your spirits up? Now, the humor is obviously part of it, cause, but how did you keep that momentum going? Because this was, what, 12 years, 13 12 years? 12 years. 12 years. Yeah, I think, um, first of all, everybody bought into the nobility of the mission. Everybody was from the day one. We said, this, this is important. This ought to happen. This will happen. We'll make this happen. Two, everybody was committed. You know, we now, you know, I threw my million dollars in the pot now. I'm not going <laughs> to just go down the toilet. Um, <laughs> but three, well, three was we all had confidence in, in the vision. I mean, it, every time we'd have a meeting, Lonnie would have one exhibition, you know, as part of the meeting where he'd show an artifact that someone had mm -hmm. discovered, volunteered, turned up, and, you know, from shawls mm -hmm. to Bibles to, you know. My favorite, my personal favorite was the uh, 
porter's cap. The porter cap. Because mm -hmm. I had a grandfather who, who was a uh, white cap porter on the Pullman line. Um, just everything. But we, we, you know, you have to make a little progress each time. So each time, there seemed to be a little progress, kept us going, kept us going, kept us going. And then the progress started to accelerate. And then the building, and we, you know, after we decided not to knock down the Washington Monument, because we, <laughs> we, we didn't need the bad, we didn't need the bad pub. Um, you know, you could, then something starts to come up out of the ground, and you know, it just, uh, the momentum took over, and, and then you knew that this was gonna happen, we just had to keep going. Now, did you uh, train your board members so that when they were at cocktail parties or different places, I mean, we, they became advocates no, too, right? Yeah, we didn't have to train anybody because we had, we had a board of, of leaders from whatever walk of life they came. They were, you know, retired secretaries of state and generals and CEOs and huge philanthropists or, or you know, or Oprah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it's always great to have the big O. Oprah. I like that, the big O. Well, no, listen, touch a goal, that woman. Yes, indeed. Um, so the, nobody needed training, and, and nobody, we didn't have to put the lash to anybody. Every, I mean, people were committed to this thing. And that, if you, know, if you said, give me one word that accounts for the success of this project, I'd have a tough time voting between Lonnie, as one word, or commitment, as one word. Everybody was committed. Staff, board, and, and to have the board willing to go and talk. Yeah. And be that. But let's be clear, one. not everybody, not every corporation gave. We had amazing oh, yeah. people who said no. We had moments where you thought, what? I mean, the worst is, I won't tell you where it was, but I was told to go meet with the, this person who said, finally they want to talk about the museum, and so I get up early, I get there, and I'm waiting for this person for an hour and a half outside of their office, and the assistant comes out and is saying the person's name I'm supposed to meet, not mine. So finally I say, you want, do you want me? And so she nods, and I follow her down this long hall, and she doesn't say a word to me. Then the CEO comes in, and he says, hello, Lonnie. I really should let you talk, but I'm not going to. Um, and we're not going to support this, so thank you very much for coming. And then as I was being let out by the CEO, the woman that led me in is covering her mouth giggling. And oh. I remember thinking, if this had happened early in the tenure, I would have been done. But luckily we had success. But not everybody bought into this. But luckily, with people like Dick and Ken, they were able to sort of helped me feel that we could get over all the no's, and ultimately we got to yes. And that was the partnership, too, that you would call him and say, guess what just happened? Exactly. And you probably knew the person. Right. Okay. Wasn't a friend not. of mine. <laughs> <laughs> and being a Jersey boy, I had some thoughts, but I didn't go That there. crowbar. <laughs> yeah, well, that crowbar might come in handy. Um, but so with that teamwork, and, and being able to have that, that was really what you had to do. Well, that, you know, nobody succeeds on her own or his own. It's always collaborative effort. And we had good collaboration. Mm -hmm. Good collaboration between the board and the management. Lonnie had good help. I mean, it wasn't all Lonnie. He had good staff. Uh, we had, you know, lots of volunteers who came to play to be. There was always a member of Congress present at our meetings because they were invested in this thing. So, um, you know, a bunch of people working collaboratively towards a single goal. Seems like that choir we just saw. You need everybody. Well, we weren't that good. <laughs> <laughs> but you gotta have everybody working together. They were good. Now, speaking of young people and, and, yeah. and, and mix and everything, so young people are getting energized. Uh, in the communities, um, especially using the arts and history and culture. And so we wondered if there was any advice for them because you, you face that um, rejection and that, but I, you're older. 
I think what's really key is to recognize that there are so many people, young, young people who want to participate, want to be engaged. We found that they became some of our biggest supporters. Um, not so much even big financial supporters, but basically coming to events, basically helping us get the word out. And what I find so powerful is that the folks who support us, the young folks, they use the technology that they own. Yeah. Right? So right. therefore, there was a, a way that we learned how to reach those communities through the work they did, through the kinds of things they always did. And so for us, it was really recognizing that we said, here is something you can help us do that can change a country. Here is something that can really be transformative. And the excitement was palpable. And we learned so much from working with this, these communities that ultimately it changed the way we did our work. And that now what I'm proudest of is that when you come to the museum and look at the attendance, there is a whole array of millennials that own the museum um, that are really the next two generations that are going to support culture. And that's so important to me. And financially support, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. Did you target some of the young uh, professionals and business? Oh, we had people? we had all kinds of groups and you know sort of young professionals and young ladies. We had a, a function. I was still CEO of Time Warner. We had a function where mm -hmm. remember this one? We had a party. An event. After all, at the end of the day, we are black people, right? So. <laughs> It was an event. So we had a party. Yeah, but I had to work. Yeah, well, you had to, Lonnie had to do the work. I got the band. And it was mostly all these young professionals that came. And, you know, I was, I was three weeks cleaning them out of the building. They, they were like, <laughs> yeah, they, they hit out. And they, but they, uh, they have energy. And the thing about today's millennials, say what you will, they all want to change the world. They all yes. want to have impact. They all yeah. want to make a difference. And if you can give them, as Lonnie just said, if you can say, well, here's something you can make a difference, they sign up. And it sounds like you trusted them. Oh. He did. <laughs> <laughs> I have too many of them in my life to do that. <laughs> <laughs> he trusted them. And it worked. Yeah, it did. And I think, the, you know, what we had to think about was this whole entrepreneurial issue. How do we get different communities to support? How do we get young folks, you know, to say, can you give $5,000 over five years just to get into the process of philanthropy? I grew up in a town that had a gas station that had a sign that said, cash makes no enemies, let's be friends. So I was looking for friends everywhere. Um, and I think we were successful in reaching out because the other thing we did that was so important was we created a membership program, right? For $25 or $100, you could be a part of the museum. And I remember very early in my career talking to this older woman and trying to get some collections from her, and she said, you can have the oval photograph on the wall, but you can't have what's stuck in the frame. And what was stuck in the frame was her father's membership card from 1913 from the NAACP. Mm -hmm. And I never forgot how important that was. Mm -hmm. So we came up with this notion of being members. Now, a lot of people told us, you can't do that. You're not even open yet. And when you're open, you're free. But I knew people wanted to own this. And so we ultimately now have more members than any Smithsonian Museum has ever had. Wow. And as you know, $25 adds up. <laughs> and so you let the communities be part of it, too. It wasn't just the big donors, the Congress people, or anything like that. It was everybody owns this and can contribute. Because remember, we had to have congressional support. And in Washington, you have a wonderful member of Congress, but she can't vote. So my notion was, let us look at doing projects getting members so that we could show a national reach. So what I did, as soon as we started getting members in large numbers, we break it down via congressional district. So every time I'm on the Hill, I can say, there are X number of members in your district that care. So it was really, everything had to have more than one bounce. Yes, it was about ownership. Yes, it was about raising money. But it was also about giving me political cover. 
political cover slash advocacy and having that and going on the Hill because a lot of people in this audience are going to be over there tomorrow. And any, any advice? Because you did pretty well, well with the president. Well, now remember, <laughs> working for the executive branch, we don't advocate, we educate. That's true. Okay. And inform. Uh, uh, you know, um, we inform. But I think, the, I think the reality was finding out who the angels were that we knew would support us and then really getting them excited about the museum. We had something that was really special. We said, you rarely, rarely get a chance to build a national museum. And then a national museum about issues that divided us that issues that have shaped this country, that if you help build this museum, we might find reconciliation and healing. I mean, that became something that so many members of Congress could get excited about. So we spent a lot of time thinking about messaging and what's the right yeah. way to be able to bring as many people under the tent as possible. And as Dick said, one of the most important things we did was to say this was not simply an African-American museum for African-Americans, that it was using a culture a community as a lens to understand what it means to be an American. And that helped us with the corporate community, helped us with the federal government. Um, in some ways, it said, here's how you as an African American can claim your Americanness. And that was really strongly part of how we were successful on the Hill and in the corporate community as well. The other thing I, I would add to that, and it's a more generalized comment, but I honestly believe, sometimes it's tough nowadays, but I honestly believe that most of the women and men up on that hill, they're there for the right reasons. I mean, they came to do good. Now, they get caught up in the system and sometimes pulled in other directions by the realities of politics um, in, in, in the community today, in the world today, in this country at least today. But if you can put something in front of them that that speaks to the why we're here in the first place, um, it can resonate. And the arts, not just this museum, mm -hmm. and not just museums, but the arts in general, the arts are unifiers. They bring people together. And Lord have mercy, do we need things that are gonna bring folks together? And you can do this. There, there really aren't folks on the other side. There's no downside, really. Um, and so maybe enough of them, and obviously you heard from the president a moment ago um, that you know, they keep restoring the funding for the arts. Maybe you know, we, can, we can create a case that they'll find the courage to sort of say, well, that's why we're here. We're here to do stuff good for the country, and this is good for the country. This is, this is a positive use that drives out negativity. And the bringing people together. And what about also giving people an opportunity to be creative or express themselves in a, a positive way with the arts? I mean, I think, the arts, I think the arts are, candidly, the heartbeat of a country. And if you don't pay attention to that heartbeat, the country dies. Um, I think they're that important. Um, and it's not just the creativity, although that's a major part of it, but it's also the fact that the arts, that culture, are a bulwark that protect people, that allow people to grapple with the things that hurt them or worry them or inspire them. So in some ways, the arts are the glue that in some ways it's like invisible glue that sometimes politicians don't realize how much the arts hold together, and I think it's our job to be able to be out there and make the arguments, not just based on we're good, we're nice, we're important, but that we're essential. And I think that's the way we're gonna have to pick this argument in this, in this new political age we're in. That's right. The invisible glue, and now in the corporate communities, when you're talking about that, how are they with that? Well, I think uh, most corporations, you know, first of all, America is unique in terms of, of this whole third sector, of whole nonprofit sector, and the arts uh, in particular not being funded by the governments, so to speak, but being funded by 
by you know, a, a, a sector of private individuals and companies that essentially provide the underpinning. And now, of course, those people vote, so government has come on top. But uh, you know, we're in a new age of CSR, corporate social responsibility. Every corporation now has to think about that. You know, we're moving towards this, what they call double bottom line reporting, not just what was your financial results, but what were your results in terms of enhancing and building a community. So that I think we're, we're, we're actually approaching or at the, in the middle of the beginning and maybe even at the end of the beginning of a new kind of period of, of enhanced and more robust corporate participation in the arts because people are looking to say, well, you know, we don't, it's nice that you do well, but we also think you ought to do good. Um, so I think, I, and also, uh, as government backs away from things, the more enlightened corporate leadership says we got to move in and fill in behind. Nature pours a vacuum. We can't do without the arts, so we have to fund them. I just wish that was 12 years ago, but I'll take it now. Yeah. yeah. I mean, remember that 50 million more you got than you needed. <laughs> That's right. You're right. You're right. And the foundation world, too. How are yeah, they looking well, at the things? Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. Um, historically, uh, the foundations have played a large role in the arts because that's who's made up foundation boards. But of late, uh, and particularly with the new money that's come from these uh, tech billionaires who, who now purport to run the world, there's a big focus on, on global development. And I, by the way, as the chairman of the Rockefeller Foundation, I don't dismiss that. Food, health, jobs, fundamental. Um, and the arts have gotten not quite, uh, they haven't moved at the same speed. So that if you look at the amount of money that's coming out of the private sector, particularly the foundation sector, it hasn't diminished, but it hasn't grown like it has in these other sectors. But, but the arts will be there. They'll, they'll because of people like, who are in this audience, who are advocates, and who will go out and who will advocate for it. And again, as I think, you know, the realities of fiscal constraint hit government. One of the reasons that the foundations could back away a little bit, let's say starting in the 70s to 80s, was because of the rise of all of these state councils and, stuff and public funding. As that levels out, maybe even that water level goes down a little bit, I think the foundations will be there to pick up the slack. That's what I think. And it's an but, but you know, right now, the, you know, everybody wants to be gathered around the global development trough, doing food or health or jobs. So we're almost, um, and I, I really hate to, to end because I still want to know exactly what you said to President Bush <laughs> <laughs> and how you got those million dollars. Um, but with I just, our. Mine is, my answer is easy. I borrowed Lonnie's crowbar. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but with, with people going tomorrow uh, to really go into an interesting uh, political arena and representing something that is... Fundamental. Something. Uh, it's not defense. It's not world peace in that sense. But what any words that you can... Well, I mean, I think yeah. everybody in this audience believes in the power of the arts, believes in the importance of it. So first, you can't ever lose that belief because it's that passion that's going to begin to convey to the members of Congress and others that you talk to why it's important. But also, I think the realization is that advocacy is an everyday occurrence, that it's not something you can drop into, although it's important to come to Washington, but it's something that you do at the local communities and the state government. And so in essence, what I look for are, are arts organizations thinking about that as part of the overall mission. And how does that play out in, in, in allocation of staff and time and directors' resources? So for me, it is crucial to recognize this is the cost of doing business. 
and that the advocacy that you have to do is something that you have to do almost every day. One thing, yeah. <laughs> that I would add, and now I'm going to sound like Lonnie. In every community, right? And this is why there really is no opposition to the art. In every community, red or blue, or purple, um, there are scores of arts organizations that are part of the constituency mm -hmm. of every representative of that community. And, and it can be, you know, there's some schools, they have fundraisers to get money to buy band instruments mm -hmm. for the school band, and others, they do, you know, things at the holidays, they have the little nutcracker or something like that. I mean, every community, there's <laughs> something going on. It's not all Art Basel, right? Um, <laughs> and so understanding what, what, the, what the various activities are in your communities and then bringing that to the attention of the representatives of those communities, it, 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 it personalizes, brings them down to their constituents. You know, this is important to all of us. Well, I can't thank you enough. And I know you in the audience that are going to be on the Hill tomorrow are fired up and ready to go. <laughs> so thank you. You have had oh, the experts. Are, are we dismissed? <laughs> because I know you'll want to try to buttonhole them and everything. You have, as you can see, the wonder team. And what they have accomplished yeah. is we all are in your debt. That's right. What? One big guy, another guy. <laughs> so thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And good luck tomorrow. Thank you. Wow, what a magnificent program. Thank you, Dr. Hayden, for conducting a truly engaging conversation with Lonnie Bunch and Dick Parsons. Good evening, everyone. My name is Julie Morocco, and I'm chair of Americans for the Arts Board of Directors. Thank you. I'm so proud of this organization and all we do on behalf of the arts. We have accomplished so much over the years, and there's so much more to do. It is my great pleasure to thank once again the incomparable Lonnie Bunch and the remarkable Dick Parsons for their unforgettable mark on the Nancy Hanks Lecture on Arts and Public Policy, now in its 31st year. And they were funny. <laughs> I also want to thank another national treasure, Americans Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden, for masterfully interviewing these extraordinary individuals. And it just wouldn't be an Americans for the Arts event without an artistic performance as the one we heard tonight. Our thanks again to the Washington Performing Arts Gospel Choir, who with their gifted voices, go ahead. Who with their gifted voices made our own hearts and minds sing. Their performance set the stage tonight for a very important policy discussion at the Eisenhower Center of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. And finally, I want to thank all of you in the audience tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining the 31st annual Nancy Hanks Lecture on Arts and Public Policy. I know that there are hundreds of arts advocates in the audience with us tonight who've traveled long distances across the country to participate in Arts Advocacy Day tomorrow on Capitol Hill. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for your commitment. And the nation thanks you for standing up for the arts. <laughs>